Good morning and welcome to the 2021 AHA Texas Conference on Introductory History Courses. I'm Julia Brookin, Special Projects Coordinator with the American Historical Association and I organized this series of events. I'm happy that we've all been able to make it online today to hear our panel on the subject, A Return to Humanity in Teaching with Stephanie M. Foote, Daniel McInerney, Tamiko M. Meeks and Amy Powers. So before we begin, a few logistics. Uh, all participants are muted. To submit questions, use the Q&A function. The chat function will not be accessible to attendees, but we will use the Q&A function. The presenters will present. Um, you can submit questions throughout, and then we'll address them at the end of the presentations. Um, we hope to address all of them, but we will also try to keep us to time. So we might paraphrase, paraphrase or combine questions. And finally, a quick reminder that the webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording after the live session. Um, by registering for or participating in AHA's web-based events, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's code of professional conduct. And um, there, we'll put a link to that in the chat as well. So uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to today's panel organizer and the chair, um, the esteemed Stephanie Foote. Stephanie Foote is the Senior Associate Vice President for Teaching, Learning, and Evidence-Based Practices at the John N. Gardner Institute for Excellence in an Undergraduate Education. Thank you so much, Julia. I appreciate the introduction and thanks to all of you for the opportunity to share this time together in this virtual space. We're so glad to be with you today. So we have a um, filled hour um, and we're very excited to have an opportunity to share with you some of the things that we've been doing over the last year, 18 months plus, um, in terms of making changes to our own pedagogy and practice in our courses. Uh, we thought we would start with a brief introduction. So I'll talk a bit about the foundation and premise of this return to humanity and teaching. Then I'll turn it over to our panelists, um, Dan, Tamiko, and Amy, who will be sharing some personal examples uh, from their own introductory history courses. And then we'll have an opportunity for some questions and answers. But as Julia mentioned, we invite your questions throughout the presentation. So feel free to put those in the Q&A area. I wanna start with a quote that um, as we were preparing for this presentation, uh, I've been thinking about a lot, um, not just in terms of the, the presentation preparation, but just in my own teaching practice over this time that we've been experiencing the pandemic. I've been reminded of this quote and I've been thinking a lot about it. And as uh, we look at it, it may be something that's familiar to you all, but if it isn't, uh, this comes from a piece that I think is pretty foundational. It's written by Parker Palmer um, in a piece called The Courage to Teach. And in it, he writes, good teaching cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching comes from the identity and integrity of the teacher. And during the pandemic, and even before the pandemic, one of the things that I found myself struggling with is this relationship between my own identity and the, the way that I show up in my classes. Um, and as you can see from the Parker Palmer quote, there's this relationship, this um, symbiotic relationship that exists between who we are and how we teach. And so this is really the, the foundation, the jumping off point for this conversation that we hope to have today. And it really serves as the foundation for the personal and pedagogical examples we'll be sharing from our own teaching practice over the next few minutes together. So again, I wanna thank you all so much for uh, making time and space in your day for this presentation. And for anyone who's watching the recording, thank you all as well for making the time for this. Um, I also wanna thank my colleagues, Dan, Tamiko, and Amy who are joining me today who accepted the invitation, probably not knowing exactly what they were signing up for, but they did so wonderfully and willingly. Um, and we've over the last couple of years had a chance to get to know each other, uh, the four of us, through the History Gateways work that we've been doing uh, with the AHA and the Gardner Institute where I work. And uh, Dan is going to talk a bit more about the History Gateways work, so I'm not going to um, take that thunder. <laughs> I'll let him describe that in just a few minutes, but we've had a chance to get to know each other over the last few years in that capacity. 
So we have created for you all um, a wakelet, a resource wakelet that includes links to the references and resources to which we will refer in this presentation. This is a QR code for the wakelet, but we will also put in the chat the hyperlink so you can click right on that. And when you do, you'll see this um, resource, rich resources, I think, um, within the wakelet. So there's a copy of the slides and again, everything that we will refer to, including some things that we won't have time to really get into because of the, the short span of time that we have for this session today. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, a lot of the information that I'll be sharing over the next couple of minutes comes from a piece that I wrote that's linked in the wakelet and it has the same title of this, as this presentation. So it's a return to humanity and teaching. And as I mentioned, um, in my own teaching practice, and I teach part-time now, I was teaching full-time for many years before coming into my work at the Gardner Institute. I've really uh, worked a lot in the last year and a half um, on thinking about the ways in which I can bring more of myself to my classes and how I can allow my students to do that as well, regardless of mode and modality. So even when I was uh, teaching online, hybrid, face-to-face, and so really this, um, this came from that quote that I shared from Parker Palmer and this desire to really uh, do more to bring myself and my students to my class and to really understand how we all show up. So in this first section, very quickly, um, I wanna share with you all some thinking around understanding more about myself as a teacher, as an instructor. So I've been considering and asking myself, uh, not just considering, but asking myself these sorts of questions about my own identities and values and how those influence the ways in which I teach and design my courses. So these are some questions that I've used personally to guide my thinking about the ways in which, um, again, my identities are influencing my own teaching practices. And I think this has been a really important part of this journey to really begin to understand more about how I influence my course um, and how I might be privileging my own identities or some that are familiar to me um, in the design and delivery of my courses. So these are some of the questions that I've been asking myself and interrogating um, as I've considered what I might do differently to really create a more inclusive environment for my students. Um, in the wakelet, I've linked a, a Google Doc that you could use if you wanted to reflect on these questions yourself, and I would invite you to consider doing that. I use a version of that document myself in my own teaching practice, so I've been doing this for the last three semesters. Uh, reflecting on these questions every semester and others that I provided in that Google Doc. I thought a lot about ways in which I can humanize my pedagogy and I've been guided by a lot of work that's out there, but uh, largely by Michelle Bukansky Brock, who is a scholar um, in digital and online teaching and learning. Um, and this is a definition on um, humanized pedagogy that came from a paper that she co-authored that was published in 2020. So when I think about ways in which I can create a more inclusive and responsive environment within my classes, um, I have to start again with who I am, and then I need to understand better who my students are, and then I need to use these understandings moving forward to design these really responsive and inclusive learning environments. So this definition has really been foundational to me as well, and thinking about the power and impact uh, pedagogy can have on students um, and on the learning environment. This is some more work um, by Michelle Pukansky Brock, if you're interested, um, her principles and her guide to humanizing online classes has been uh, very useful and instructive to me as I've sought to make changes in my own teaching pedagogy. I won't get into this, but these resources are linked for you in that wakelet that we've shared. In addition, I've also uh, reflected on reflective teaching practices, and this is a an approach um, that you can take, that I've taken in my own teaching practice uh, that's been informed by Stephen Brookfield. So within this reflective teaching approach, Brookfield encourages um, faculty and staff who are teaching to consider ways in which they can um, make changes on, in their own teaching practice to engage in continuous improvement in their teaching practice um, by collecting information from various different lenses. So often we're looking at student evaluations, but we also need to incorporate within that some form of formal reflection. We need to be thinking about ways in which we can ask our students periodically about their learning and engagement in the course. So to take the temperature, so to speak, of the students to gather informal feedback from them, 
We also need to be thinking about ways in which we can invite peers and colleagues, of course, into our classes uh, for um, peer evaluation of teaching, but also we need to engage with a scholarly literature that helps to inform the improvements that we might make based on what we've learned. I wanna move quickly now into understanding our students. Um, this is a, a piece that you won't be able to read probably on the screen, but it's linked um, in the wakelet. And I would encourage you to take a look at this. Um, although this comes from a biology journal and biology is not my discipline, I should probably also say history is not my discipline, but it's my adopted discipline now. <laughs> uh, this, this piece is really fantastic because it helps us to think about ways in which we can get to know better who our students are and what their specific needs are. So this is an intro survey that we might give right before a class begins, so beginning of class survey. And in the, the paper, and there are other examples of beginning of semester, beginning of course surveys in the wakelet, we're gathering micro data about our students. So we're understanding better who they are, what their needs are, what their perceptions are about the class, how they'd like to be referred to, so pronouns, um, name preferences, all of that information that we might be gathering sort of ad hoc. It gives us a way to systematically gather the information. And during the pandemic, I've also been asking my students how they will be accessing the information in our course. How will you be completing assignments in the course? We'd be doing that primarily on a laptop or on some other sort of a device, like a, a phone or another form of a, a device, iPad, tablet, whatever. This has been really important because I've been able to think about and structure um, aspects of the course to be responsive to the ways in which the students will be interacting with and engaging with the information. So these, this sort of microdata can be useful. What's also great about this paper that I'm sharing up on the screen now is that it gives you ideas of how you can use the information you're learning about your students. So how you can be responsive to that within your own uh, pedagogy and also within the design of your course. It's not too late in the semester, even if you're in the mid or latter part of the semester, there's still questions here that you could use to check in with students um, from this instrument. So there are things that you could do now and then certainly you could set this up as something to do next semester. Lastly, I'm not gonna go into any of these in detail because I'm actually going to turn it over momentarily to Dan, um, but I am going to rapid fire, go through just the slides to share with you um, some of the inclusive and responsive practices that I've used in my own courses and I've included in the short paper that I wrote and also in some of the resources, some of my own personal examples. So I won't go into detail again, but I'm also very happy to talk with you about these at any point if you're interested in my contact information is at the end of the presentation. So I've been using um, statements of inclusion and uh, statements, oops, about teaching and learning during a pandemic. These come directly from my syllabus. Um, I've also been working on, this is not mine, but I've been using a version of this to inform um, expectations in my course. This is from Fabiola Torres um, and a liquid syllabus that she created. And I've included more information about liquid syllabi in the resources for this presentation. But I love her pact, you know, what you can expect from me, what I will expect from you. And I've been uh, using that in my own courses as well, an adaptation of this. And that's just a larger version of it. I've also been using universal design for learning. Uh, these are the guidelines uh, for UDL in terms of my course design, thinking about inclusion and access. I've also created a liquid syllabus. You can see some of the excerpts from my liquid syllabus. Syllabi I have multiple um, in the wakelet and you can see up on the screen in front of you. And this is Fabiola Torres's liquid syllabus. I've also hyperlinked hers in the wakelet, it's fantastic. And I'd be happy to have a sidebar conversation if anyone's interested in learning more about liquid syllabi. I've also used TILT, uh, Transparency and Learning and Teaching. And I use this to convey to my students the purpose, task, and criteria for each assignment. And infographics, as you can see, and then this is the Google Doc that I referenced earlier that I've created. If you're interested in thinking about how you can use any of these ideas and those that you'll hear from over the next 30 or 40 minutes from my colleagues um, in your own professional practice. And in this, I've also included some of those guiding questions that I started with. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dan McInerney. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Stephanie. Uh, and uh, thanks to all of you in the audience um, for, uh, for being here. Let's see, do what? Let me put my video back on. Start.
sorry. Um, we can see you, Dan. You can? Yes, Okay, we can. sorry, I'm sorry. All right, um, uh, I just want to make an opening comment about this. I know that uh, so much of uh, Stephanie's comments revolved around the idea of humanizing our teaching. I, I have to think, and especially uh, since March of 2020, uh, so much of my thinking about, uh, about the classroom has been the way in which I've been socializing my teaching, uh, trying to think less about myself and putting myself in the, in the position of the students. How are they seeing this course? Uh, how do they react to uh, the organization of the course, the way I'm presenting it, their participation in it, uh, trying to see the course not so much as a teacher as seeing the course as a student. Uh, focusing, in other words, less on my own personal individual intentions and trying to understand more clearly the consequences for others. Um, and this really came together, not just because of the pandemic, but because of two projects that intersected with one another. Um, I, I was, uh, I'm serving as an advisor on the History Gateways project, which is focusing on uh, what happens in terms of grades and retention and completion with students taking our introductory courses. And what the data has revealed is a very disturbing um, understanding about um, the alarming rates of D, F, W, I grades in our intro courses, especially among the most underserved, underrepresented students, racial and ethnic minorities, um, uh, economically distressed students, uh, students who are first generation, um, people who not only re receive alarmingly high levels of DFWI grades, but more importantly, how those grades and their performance in the class affects retention and completion. It's a, it's a terrible story, an alarming one, and one that we need to address. And again, it's another way to put ourselves in the position of students. This coincided with work at my own university, Utah State University, where I decided to take a shift in my own teaching of the introductory course and join a project on a competency-based general education program designed for working adults who are not on campus, who have no post-secondary credentials, um, and who are trying to gain these credentials in order to improve their lives and their work. Uh, these are basically rural students. It's Utah, so there aren't many racial and ethnic minorities that we're dealing with here. But these are other students who are, uh, who are struggling to try to build a better life for themselves and their families. In these competency-based courses throughout about six disciplines. Uh, next. And what this is... What this has all made me do is to think about the guidelines that I bring to my class itself. The need first and foremost in both of these projects to know more about, as Stephanie has said, our students, their backgrounds, interests, needs, and expectations. Uh, next, to focus less on majors <clears throat> within my teaching and focus my attention on beginners, especially students who are maybe one-timers who may never take another history course at all in their college work. To address, to come into a class not thinking about uh, the weaknesses of a student, but to think about the assets that they bring in because of who they are and the lives they've lived. Uh, next. From uh, This is from a uh, group in New York City, Public Agenda, to always begin where people are, not where you want them to be. And finally, uh, the importance of making the implicit explicit, not assuming that students are discipline experts. They are just coming into a discipline. They don't know the rules of the game. They don't understand how we approach education. Next. And I think the best place to start with this, if you wanna get a sense of making the implicit explicit, 
is to look at the work of colleagues from Indiana University and a project called Decoding the Disciplines, uh, a project which, next, a project which takes basic information that we just take for granted in our courses and has us reflect on what we're saying to students and what they are hearing when we give a simple instruction such as, for the next class, read 50 pages in Foner's study of, of uh, reconstruction. What do students hear when they hear the word read and what do we mean by it? If there's one chapter you should look at on this issue, it's by our colleague David Pace on decoding the reading of history, trying to take apart how students read versus what the way in which historians read and to recognize the guidance we have to give students with basic information, read, explain, analyze, uh, not to take any of this for granted. Next. In class itself, I've tried to do this next by bringing together the competencies I've identified for this course. And I've created a list of them that I share with students. Um, and I, I do focus on chronology. You know why? Um, the Confederate monuments controversy, uh, the importance of trying to make, get people to understand those monuments were post-war phenomena, not pre-war phenomena. Um, the contextualization of our, of our discussions, relating past events to the present, doing historical research and working on writing on their communication abilities. So the first paper I have students do is to write about themselves and their families, to tell me about their family's educational history. This, this paper made such a difference in the attitude of students toward the course itself. It made, it made them feel so much a part of doing histories by starting personally. Uh, the second project I have a student do is, a, is an open discussion where they're sharing comments with one another. And I'm asking them why they enrolled in the class. This tells me even more about my students, who they are, what they're interested in, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, next. Uh, I go on in the last discussion at the end of 15 weeks, trying to determine how students have done over the past 15 weeks. In, in this case, what's, what's been the effect of the pandemic on them, their lives, their jobs, their economic condition. And then I tie that to another question that makes them ask them to reflect uh, on the role of government in national emergencies. Next. And their final research paper, again, doing history from a local level outward, is to work on a project developed by our colleague at Marshall University. Next, it's called Clio. Clio is a website where students, educators, the public can submit information about historical monuments, places, events, within their own communities. Uh, this is an edited website. It locates these places on a map. This shows my own area in uh, Northern Utah. Uh, and some of those dots indicate what my students have done on this site. Next. These are students again, who are not on campus. They are working full time. All of them had families that they had to be with and support. These are not students who can make it to our library to set up discussions with our librarians and researchers. So I'm focusing their notions of history on their own community to let them understand the richness of where they live. And these are just some of the topics they've picked uh, that appear on Clio now. The other advantage of this project is that it gives students a broad audience. They're not just writing for me. They know they're writing for viewers, not just in the US, but around the world. 
they are so proud of these achievements, so proud that they can bring knowledge of their community to others. And they get such experience in basic research methods, not just the kinds of, um, the, the kinds of sources they go to, and I'm guiding them through all this, but also encouraging them to engage in interviews, to talk with people, to conduct, to do oral history, to gather information from others. They're just remarkable projects that students put together with no background in history. And I tried to not only um, guiding them through this, but reminding them of what they're contributing to a sense of the history of their community, their region, and uh, who they're helping to understand the richness of the past. Next. These are some, just some ways in which bringing together the Gateways Project and the, um, and the competency-based project, I've, I've tried to turn the roadblocks of our introductory courses into gateways for future educational opportunities. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan. I think the work you've done is inspiring. I, I love this idea of turning roadblo roadblocks into gateways. I'm going to turn it over now to our colleague, Tamiko Meeks. Uh, Tamiko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I feel like that was such a hard act to follow, Daniel. It's so impressive. And so much of um, what you're doing is also what I do in my work at, at Texas Southern. And so I wanted to take a little bit of a different track and talk about some of the things that I'm doing in the class to uh, foster bringing humanity back into the classroom. And Stephanie, you talked a lot about identity and, and thinking about who you are in terms of how that relates back into your classroom. And I spent quite a bit of time doing that because I always think back to when I was in college and like what I needed and the things that I did not have. Um, and I want my students to really feel comfortable and secure in their education and feel comfortable in coming, you know, and talking to their instructors, especially if they're having issues. And so my personal philosophy, I, I take much of it from Maya Angelou who said it, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And, you know, I, sometimes I feel like, oh, that's very basic, but in a real way, that's what students need. They need to know that as their instructor, that you care about them. I mean, I've heard that so many times over and over from my students. And so my goal is to always give students the best of me as an educator, as a historian, and as a citizen, and have the information that they learn in my class be a transformative experience. Um, next slide. So some of the um, ways that I try to foster um, student and faculty connections is at the beginning of the class, especially in my online classes, I will have um, students introduce themselves and they will do a video where, you know, because a lot of times they're not seeing each other. These, this is, a, my classes are um, asynchronous, so they never see each other, but they record themselves. They, they tell the class a little bit about who they are, what their interests are, and why they're taking the class. And I always have to like prompt them to say, it's not just because it's required. We all know that it's required. Why else are you interested in taking the class? And, and, and what do you feel like needs to be focused on when you're studying history? I also encourage them to um, make con connections through GroupMe. And I have a virtual cafe that I set up inside of our learning management system, which is Blackboard, where they can, you know, talk with each other, they can ask me questions, but I always tell them do not put any personal information on there if you have something personal in nature that you need to contact me directly. And then we have a TA that sort of floats around um, 
through all of our instructors. And I have the TA come into the class. We'll do breakout sessions like on Friday. My classes are Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so usually Monday and Wednesday are devoted to, to lecture, but on Friday, we'll take that time to break out into breakout sessions and students will bring in whatever they're working on that particular week. Um, you know, for more for more guidance. And that is really working out well this semester because I have an additional person in there and students, you know, sometimes they feel maybe a little intimidated coming to their instructor, right? And so that's sort of a soft cushion for them having the TA there. And then I also have um, the TA sometimes lead a lecture and the students really respond well to that also. And on Monday, what I try to do is in my face-to-face -face class, we have a class meeting. And so I'll talk about, we'll do like housekeeping things if students had questions from over the weekend. And I will also take them through whatever the assignment is for that particular week. And you talked about like making, Daniel, you talked about making the implicit explicit. And that's one of the things that I've really sort of tried to hone in on over you know, the course of this last decade that I've been teaching. Because when I started teaching, I was just like, oh, everybody knows how to do this. And I was quickly proven wrong um, and that students needed more guidance. So I will, when I set up their assignments, I give them literally everything that they need from the sourcing guide to whatever readings or websites that they could go to. I give them templates, they have an outline because I don't want them to feel as though you know they're lost or they don't know what to do or how to do it. And we'll take time and walk them through exactly how something should be done. But I also tell them that I'm never looking for perfection. Um, and I give them my own examples of, of things that I'm working on where I may have missed, you know, putting in a citation correctly to show them that it's okay, right? My whole point is that you're trying and that you're working towards um, meeting a specific goal, learning a particular skill. And I always try to reinforce with them every time we meet that what you're learning in this class you will be able to take with you and use it in any class that you're taking whether it's another social science or if it's math or a science class right and then also I allow students to give me feedback and so an example of that was this semester I was looking and noticing that you know some students weren't turning in their work and so I just asked them one day, like, what's going on? And they were like, Professor Meeks, your assignments, they're crazy, they're hard, like, we don't get it. And so I said, okay, okay, I, 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 I'm kind of sort of understand that. So what I'll do, and this is my commitment to you, we will come into class and I will set aside time for the TA and I to work with you if you, when you have questions, will be there, but you have to commit to me and to the TA that you're gonna do your part. You will read, you will come to class with something prepared for us to go over. And for the most part that that's been working. And, and Daniel, you, you talked about, you know, what do students hear when you say read? Well, they hear, I gotta read 50 pages and that's it, they like totally zone out. And what I've been trying to teach them is how to do close reading, how to, how to read critically. And I'll bring in some of my books and I'll show them, you know, this is when I'm, when I'm reading, this is what I do. I annotate everything. I'm writing in the margins and showing them that, you know, this is what you need to do, whether you're writing on what it is that you're reading or you have a notebook next to you so that you can keep track of your thoughts around a particular subject, All right? Um, next slide, please. So this is just um, a picture of the virtual cafe 
that I have set up in the, in the Blackboard. And students, they're using it. They will talk with each other if they have questions about assignments or sometimes they'll direct those questions directly towards me. But I put it there to sort of give them um, this sense of accountability where they need to understand that, yes, I'm here and I'm, I'm teaching you and I'm directing you, but you're also responsible for your own learning in a real way. Um, next slide. And what I really try to foster in my classroom is the idea of teamwork. We're all a team. I'll say to them several times throughout the semester, we're family. You know, the first day that you walked in here, you were all were strangers, but we're nine weeks into the semester. We are a family. And, you know, it's okay. If, if you have a question about something, ask your neighbor. If your neighbor doesn't know, come to me, come to the TA. Because when we work together as a team, that is going to be what will make all of you be successful in the class. Next slide. And so some other things that I've done in the age of COVID, right, in, in terms of practicing humanity, is that I started a blog in um, my classes and it's focused on social justice issues. And it's a place where my students can connect with other students. Um, I'm on a, a grant with Howard University and we're looking specifically at social justice issues. And so I will, I've connected my students with other students that are taking classes in that. And so that's another way for, that's a way for them to connect with people who are outside of, of Texas Southern, right? And to focus on issues that have meaning for them. And I also try to model kindness and empathy in my classroom and outside of the classroom. And I instill growth mindsets that are premised on student accountability to build their confidence. Because what I've learned over the years is that students have an abundance of issues and sometimes they're just afraid. They, I've, I had a student on Monday and told me, you know, I haven't come to talk to you because I figured you were like the rest of my instructors and they didn't care. And I was like, um, you've been with me how long? You've been with me nine weeks. You, you haven't, got, he was like, yeah, I finally got it. That's why I came and talked to you. Right. And then also, I want them to know that mistakes are OK because we are all human. Next slide. And my firm belief is that learning is about connectedness. And I want to make sure that my students needs are met. Um, I, I really saw that be a problem when COVID initially hit and we had to make this quick transition from face to face to online learning for everyone and I had students who did not have laptops they still didn't have books and they were struggling and I realized that I had had to extend a lot of grace and be patient and understand that you know everyone's at a different place and that like Dan said, we have to meet our students where they are. And so that just sort of turned on a little light bulb in my head, if you will, that because it showed the disparities between students and that not everybody was on, on the same playing level. And so I, I, I really tried to make a concerted effort to make sure that students have what they need. Next slide. Now, I'm, I'm very much into students helping students and also students helping me, you know, to think about what I need to do in the class, how I can make the class better. And so one of the assignments that I have students do, and this is towards the end of the class, is I have them do a reflection and they can pick any assignment that they've worked on during the semester. And it could be an assignment that they made a good grade on and they can talk about how and why they made the grade, or it could be an assignment that they didn't um, do so well on and talk about what they could have done better and how you know, I could have helped them more. And then I also have them write a letter to a future student. And so the next three slides 
um, are just some of some of those letters. I know it's like really hard to see, but they're writing to future students and they're telling them, they're giving them guidance and telling them what will help them be successful. Like don't procrastinate, follow the directions, make sure you come to class. Um, they're, they're, they're telling them things like, if you have a problem, go and speak to Professor Meeks. She will help you, she will listen, right? And, and it's all because I want students to know that we are here to help them and to help them be successful and that they're not in this academic game alone and that we have been where they are before and we understand. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Tamiko. Every single time I spend time with Tamiko, I learn and I'm so grateful for the examples you've shared with us. I want to now turn it over to our last panelist, um, Amy Powers. And after Amy finishes her presentation, she's going to lead us right into the Q&A with whatever time we have left. Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, good morning. I am so excited to be with all of you. And I love the fact that Dan, Tamiko, and I represent three different types of institutions. So in some ways, our experiences are different, but overall, I, I think we have a lot in common. And I'm really excited by the fact that we um, each independently of one another chose to focus on the theme of connection in our presentations. And I think that just says a lot about how we're, how we're all thinking. Um, one of the most important things that I've learned um, in my experience with History Gateways is that is the importance of creating a sense of community among students. As you've already learned, you know, Dan and, and Tamiko have already has said, um, students who feel that they belong in college, um, who feel welcomed and valued are more likely to succeed. And it's so important to, to make those connections, but you know, between faculty and students, uh, among students, and then between students and their course material. Now, you know, it might seem easy to this is an easy task to or a challenge to overcome. Just welcome them and tell them that they belong here. But we all know that it's much more um, complicated than that than that, and that we have to go a little bit deeper. You know, as the title of this panel suggests. Um, it's, it's important to create inclusive learning environments where we um, celebrate or acknowledge one another's humanity and uh, celebrate and acknowledge the uh, skills and knowledge that we all have um, and, and, and recognize one another's strengths. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is just give you a few examples from my courses of um, activities and assignments that I use as a way to create, try to create an inclusive environment and try to create a connection with my students. And you'll notice that these are all very small, low stakes assignments. Um, some are graded, some are not graded, but they're things that I've been sprinkling into my courses over the past couple of years, just as a way to, to make that connection. Well, I, I'd like to start every class period with um, a question that asks them to check in. And I use a, a, a tool called Mentimeter. And um, sometimes the questions are, you know, just kind of fun. Like, what did you do this weekend? Or what do you like best about fall? But every once in a while, I use the checking in question to get a sense, uh, to gauge how they're doing emotionally. Uh, for example, this question I, I asked recently, how is your semester going so far? And you can see on the word cloud that the answers have a wide range. Some people say good or all right, um, better than expected. <laughs> um, but then there are others who say busy, stressful, uh, really horrible and sucks. <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and so actually this, this activity really kind of um, concerned me. And, and so I decided to address these concerns and, and some of this is very honest feedback um, in two ways. One, I, I sent out information to my students, um, reminding them of the resources that we have here at Wabonzi. Of course, we have academic resources, you know, the, the standard academic resources to help them. But more recently, we've been able to provide assistance with things like 
housing insecurity, food insecurity, technology needs, mental health, and even financial assistance. So I wanna remind them that that is there for them. And then I also asked one of our counselors to come in and speak with our uh, speak with the students um, and tell them about the services that counseling and advising offers. Now our counselors are academic advisors, but they're also trained in social work and sometimes psychology. And so they're able to help students navigate mental health issues and then connect them with professionals um, that, that, that could help them. And I think that's just become even more important in this time of um, you know, pandemic and, and health crisis and, and economic crisis. Oh, next slide, please. Um, now this um, question, um, I, I was just really um, heartened by. This is another one that, that I asked, you know, uh, uh, what are you grateful for today? And I actually took this idea uh, from a teaching and learning academy webinar I attended with the Gardner Institute. One of the speakers uh, focused on this idea of gratitude. And I just thought it was really beautiful. So I thought I would ask this of my students. And I've done this for, for quite a while now and I always get wonderful answers. And you can see here, um, the answers uh, reflect resilience, hope, and an emphasis on, emphasis on things that are really important, like family, friends, good health, um, a heated house, job, you know, just, just really things that are, that are important. And so um, this is, you know, this is the same group of students um, that you saw on the last slide, but a diff on a different day and a different question. So this is just, uh, just a little more uplifting and, and heartening. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, both Dan and Tamiko emphasized, you know, uh, the importance of connecting students to our discipline. And it's true, our students are really able to shine when they're able to make connections between themselves and history, so, and their own history. And so I had this really short, low stakes reflection that I asked them to do towards the beginning of the semester, um, asking them, what does history mean to you? And I'm often surprised at how candid the students are and how much they share with me. Um, some students tell me some, some very personal things, uh, challenges that they've faced or obstacles that their families have overcome. I've put uh, a few quotes up here that I pulled from different student responses, um, you know, statements that I thought were just really creative or poignant or um, kind of in insightful. Um, and so just, I, I like some of the metaphors that the students are using, you know, it's uh, history is like reading a never ending book or they're like, it's like family photographs. I just love the one, this history to me means identity and the student is the one who put the exclamation point there. And I, that's actually a really great statement that we can unpack in class, you know, talking about identity. Um, and the last one, if you just look at that quickly, I, I love this, you know, someone wrote about a letter or it's letters that they have uh, from their great, great grandmother to their great grandmother. And that's one of their most treasured possessions. And I just, I just think that's really, really great. And then my very last example of um, an assignment is um, I'm asking students to use their, their prior knowledge and their, uh, their uh, their knowledge of the world um, to uh, and apply that to what we're learning in class. And so I asked the students, um, if you could propose an alternative vision for the 21st century, what would it be? And essentially what I've done is I, I've taken a, a chapter from my world history textbook called Alternative Visions of the 19th Century, that, you know, that we've been studying that week. But I say, no, let's take a look at the 21st century. What would you propose to, to, to change, um, you know, our world today? And if you're able to look through this, I know the print is very small, you'll just see some really beautiful, insightful um, ideas, things about healthcare, access to nutritious food, education, um, ideas about opening up politics so more people can be involved, uh, pathways to citizenship. It's just, it's just very uh, inspiring. Um, and I'll, I'll just end with this. Um, over and over again, I, I've realized that, you know, this generation of students is well-informed. They are engaged with their communities and they are determined to make the world a better place. I'm not sure of the reason for this. You know, are they better informed because of social media? or because um, they have access to information so much more easily than we did when we were younger? 
or have the problems of the world be hit such a crisis point that they can't be ignored? You know, I'm not sure what the reason is, um, but I am relieved and I am confident because I know that we will be leaving the world in very capable hands. And I make sure I tell them that, you know, because I don't know how often they hear that, but I, I, I find them admirable and, um, you know, when, when I'm an old lady, I, I, will, I will feel good that they are, uh, they are in charge. <laughs> so I will just leave it with that. And, and, and please, um, if, uh, please, if anyone has any questions, I don't know if you wanted to have people unmute their mics or if there have already been questions in the, the, the chat, um, but uh, we can, we've, got, oh, we've got about nine minutes for questions. So that, that is wonderful. Thank you so much, Amy. And I do think we have um, one question in the chat, in the Q&A area. Um, Sarah has asked, what recommendations do you have for making conservative students feel more comfortable in the classroom? Would anyone like to answer that? Well, um, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, Tamiko, please go ahead. So some of the things that I do, um, thank you, Dan, for that. Um, in my class to make students who are more conservative. And it's surprising that most students seem, especially now, for whatever reason, seem to be very conservative, is I'll just call on you. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it. I try my best to learn everyone's name. And um, a lot of times students find that shocking that I know the students. And, and my sense and what I've what I've learned over the years is when I do that, they feel more comfortable in speaking up because they're like, oh, she took enough time to learn who I am. And, you know, it kind of breaks down that barrier. Um, and I tend to not like focus because I will have students who some of them, you know, they're always they always want to talk. And I'm like, no, we need to give everybody space and I let students know up front this is a safe space I will not tolerate you know anyone belittling or, or badgering someone if you know maybe they don't give the exact answer that you want right it's a safe space and everybody has the opportunity to voice their understanding of something and let's have a conversation let's dialogue around it so yeah um, I, I would just add something about where I find myself located here in Utah. I think you all recognize it's a, a quite conservative state. Uh, a steady red state. And it, it shows up in the comments that my students make uh, it, when I'm in person with students who are online with discussions that I open up. Um, I, I find that I, I mean, I have to step back, first of all, and exercise quite a bit of patience sometimes. But I'm, whatever the positions students take, left or right, uh, one thing I make clear in um, the directions for discussion is the importance of uh, civil discourse. And it's part of my rubric. They know in advance, their comments count. Um, the style of those comments, the nature of those comments, there's much that won't be tolerated. Um, but I think students pay careful attention to this when they know I'm paying attention to this question. The second thing I do with that is to try to explain to them in my own comments and discussions why this matters and why this matters not just in a history course, but in our larger society uh, and what educated people, my students, um, will hopefully do when they leave the classroom and enter public discourse. Um, a second issue with uh, students whose own ideology departs wildly from my own is for me to step back and acknowledge to them um, 
the multiple directions of, of traditional American ideals, the tensions that exist, for example, between liberty and equality, and, and a historical understanding of why people can take, well, many of my students in particular, a very contentious and suspicious attitude toward the federal government and reminders of the services, the uh, advantages they receive from that intervention that they so widely criticize. But to, to bring them into a discussion about the, the inherent conflicts within uh, prevailing American ideology and to try to calmly guide that discussion away from extremes towards an understanding of mutual interests. Uh, this takes time. I, I don't, when there's a fiery kind of comment, I purposely don't respond quickly. I sit and think about the response to it. And I also want them to understand how these arguments can be included within both uh, heavily conservative tendencies within American ideology, political ideology, and also progressive tendencies, where they intersect and where positions that they object to have also served their own interests, make them aware of that. Um, it's very difficult, and I'm sure my colleagues and all of you in the audience also understand this difficulty. And it's an ongoing process, I think, uh, always learning and discovering new strategies and, and constantly doing things different because the students in your, in your class are, are different. They're changing, we're changing, the world is changing. Uh, we have three questions that have popped up and we only have a couple of minutes. So I'm not sure that we'll be able to sufficiently address, uh, address these questions, but I think that we would invite the opportunity to uh, share responses offline with uh, those who have asked the questions. We might though um, try to tackle one very quickly. Um, these efforts sound great. However, does this assume that we have adequate time for additional effort? So quickly, um, if we could just maybe reflect on that for Dale. Um, so Dale, yeah, we never, we never have enough time. For, for any of these additional efforts. But I, th I think that, I don't know, I, and I'll just speak for myself. Um, I always look at my students as sort of an extension of my own children. And I, I always think about what my kids need and you know how I can give them enough of what they need without compromising all of the other things that I need to do. And so a lot of times, and I'll just take, for example, this week, um, you know, helping students with writing their midterms because they have to do an essay. And I did much of that in class, but there were some students that I just couldn't reach. And I told them, you can email me or you could use some of these other services that we have on campus. We have a writing lab, um, you, you can contact the tutors, you can contact the TA. So, you know, I think some of it has to be that we filled some of this out because we cannot take on everything. Like there's only one of you, um, you need time to sleep, think, eat, and, you know, have a personal life. So as much as you can, right, use the services that they're paying for. They're paying for tutors, they're paying for the writing lab, use this, tell them to utilize those services. Exactly, and Dan? I'll just, I'll just say ahead. really quick, quick oh. Go ahead, Amy. Go ahead. I'll, just, I'll just say really quickly that um, it, some of this is time consuming. Um, you know, I have, I've created a lot of small assignments that build into larger assignments. Um, and, you know, it is time consuming. Um, there, there are shortcuts, uh, rubrics, um, kind of uh, staple, feedback uh, statements, um, but but I, I would have to say it is time consuming, but on the flip side, I have found it very rewarding. Yeah. Um, and I have seen uh, success 
uh, for my students. And so that's sort of the, that's the kind of the, the gift you get at the end for, for kind and of And the extra students work. take notice of that. Like they, yeah. I've had students that will take me over and over and over again. I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, there are other instructors that you can take. So they pay attention. They, they, in a real way, they pay attention to what instructors are doing and how they're helping them. And, yeah. Well, one other quick suggestion to Dale. Uh, you're right. Uh, there's never enough time. But uh, much of this has made me focus back on uh, recommendations from another colleague of ours, Lendl Calder, mm -hmm. and his work on the possibility of uncoverage. Are you trying to march your students through all of American history? Is that the purpose of the intro course? Or are these efforts to um, communicate and connect more, uh, uh, more clearly with students leading us to understand maybe the main goal of the intro course is not to get through every event, uh, but to do so selectively to have this in mind as you begin the course, to be able to edit as you go along and to respond to what's happening within the classroom itself. Yes. Um, and, and I'd strongly recommend looking at the, the writing of uh, Lendl Calder, the topic of uncoverage as a way of thinking about how we use our time within the classroom. Yeah. You're right, Ben. Like, I feel like I've become the pivot queen. <laughs> because like yeah you have this syllabus that says you have to go from the beginning of time to the end of time and it's it's just not it's not feasible all the time right and I very much believe that you have to gauge your class if if they're stuck on a concept or a skill I'm not going to go past that until I'm confident that students grasp it because you're going to need that skill for the next thing. So let, let's get it together and let, let's work on it because content is one thing, right? Um, and we can get through it, but if you're not able to fully grasp what we're doing in the class, it, it doesn't make sense. We have some open questions that we're unable to answer. So I'm going to ask our AHA colleagues if they could please make sure that we get those in an email so we can get back in touch with the individuals who have kindly and graciously asked those questions. So thank you all very much. We appreciate um, you all following up. And thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon. This has been a fantastic session. I feel like we could go on for hours, but we won't. I know you have a lot, you all have a lot to do this afternoon, but thank you so much for making time in your day. And thank you again to my panelists and to my friends at the AHA for the opportunity to be with you all today and to talk about this topic that's so near and dear to our hearts. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.